Do you know how some people ask whether the glass is half empty or half full? I think this perspective can often be applied to board games. Hey Danny, would you say this board game box is half empty or half full? It says it's got over 200 pieces in it. It's definitely full. I guess that depends on the size of the box. The way I've looked at Euro games recently has definitely changed. I've really come to appreciate game designers more and the collection of work, especially Uwe Rosenberg. While some of his games haven't always gelled with me, the strategy of some of his simpler to learn games have often left me a lot less stitched up. One remarkable thing about his games is that he often throws players an entire sandbox of options to toy with. Instead of picking from two actions, here, have 15. In this video, we take a look at one of Uwe Rosenberg's smoothest games, in particular its solo mode, to see whether it's a game that is half empty or half full. Hmm. So I play this specialist card and because you don't have this specialist card in your hand, I get to resolve both its top and bottom abilities. I use its top ability to convert its three resources using one of my conversion buildings into another resource that I desperately need. I then use its bottom ability to then build a building from the market that increases the value of that resource that I just converted to, uh, giving me extra points at the end of the game. You describe this game as easy, breezy and nice. Oh, you know, it's just your typical Euro game. Creating glass over 700 years ago was nothing short of a spectacle. Glass Road is an intriguing game where players produce glass by harnessing the multiple talents of a team of specialists in various fields to produce basic materials that will be converted into brick and glass. You'll then use these materials to purchase three different types of buildings. Ones that convert materials into other materials, ones that provide instant bonus effects, often depending on the state of your board, and ones that provide endgame scoring bonuses. Like a new LEGO construction set, you'll have to accessorize, strategize, and calculate which buildings will synergize and meld together the best. The pathway through this game isn't always transparent. It'll require a keen eye and a knowledge of the art of glass molding. If you mold your choices well and create a really good particular engine, you'll succeed. You'll often have to spend resources immediately, however, so that they don't automatically get converted into glass or brick. The dual set of dials in this game reminds me of the dashboard of a Lamborghini, except maybe this engine probably works a lot more traditionally. There is a balance that has to be struck here. You'll increase the value of all your base resources, which will trigger the movement of the needle, increasing your production of your higher level resources. This forced transition means you'll lose one of each other base resource. It's an ebb and flow of resource management that needs to be strictly monitored and timed correctly. The paths to victory in this game are so numerous and the permutations and combinations so plentiful you can almost spend a lifetime exploring how everything works. The interaction in the card play in the multiplayer mode is intriguing. Players get to choose 5 of their 15 specialists to play each round. As players reveal a chosen card, if another player has that same card in their hand, all of those players can only resolve one of those cards abilities. If a unique card is played, then you get to resolve both abilities. What a bonus! The solo mode has you playing over 7 rounds. Each time you get to select a different number of cards to form your deck. Each time you'll randomly reveal a card and resolve one ability until there are only two cards left. From the remaining two cards, one will be resolved completely and the other one will be discarded. To make it trickier, the cards you choose to play this round are not allowed to be chosen for the subsequent round. What a curveball! So how does this all translate in the solo mode? The fact that you're not going to be able to have access to all 15 specialist cards each and every round, except for the first round, means that you're going to have to decide what do I need now and what do I need two rounds from now. And trying to make that choice when you're given 15 different cards can feel a little bit overwhelming. So something that I like to do is to group the cards together based on what they do and what their specialty is, whether it's putting out landscapes or getting you resources or ones that help you to build buildings from the market. Grouping them together helps me to see what my options are more in a piecemeal fashion. I also love um, being able to build that deck. 
So on the first round, you only have to pick three cards. So what three cards are gonna be in your pile that you'll definitely need? You'll obviously put one that you might semi need because um, you know that one card is not gonna get used at all. And you might then beef it up with two cards that you really need and try and maximize the potential of using those two cards in that round. There is a sense of randomness that does come up and I think it's actually works in the solo mode's favor because you kind of have to be tactical tactical about how you respond to things. So especially the cards that require a cost, you need to make sure that before you add that to your deck that you can pay for that cost because the worst thing is drawing one of these cards in solo mode and realizing you don't have the resource to pay for the ability. So there's that cool planning that occurs uh, from round to round to try and help give you the best options. The dual production wheels that appear in Glass Road are definitely a highlight mechanism for me in the game. The fact that they introduce this element of automatic conversion where once you've kind of got at least one of each resource, those wheels turn providing you with one glass and one brick, a higher value resource that you definitely need if you're gonna build those really great buildings. And I think that creates an interesting seesaw effect. You don't wanna increase all of your resources too quickly because as those dials turn, that diminishes the amount of basic resources you have. So for that building that you were trying to save up, you know, three logs for, if you've accidentally moved up your most basic resource and the dial turns, you've now all of a sudden only got two logs. And you're thinking, whoa, I wanted to buy that, but now my dial's turned. How am I gonna purchase that now? And so you're gonna to have to evolve and adjust your strategy. It almost has this kind of real time rotating element to it, as if like you're on a ticker timer. There is an interesting timing mechanism in that forced wheel rotation that plays have to really contend with. And I love the duality of the thought process. There's uh, two resources that appears on both wheels, the food resource and the coal resource. So whenever you're playing a specialist card that increases the amount of food that your workers get, you're thinking, well, which of those dials do I want to move? But then a lot of the buildings require both glass and brick. So if your workers aren't improving their food level on one particular factory and they're improving really well on the other, you're still not gonna be able to build what you want. And so you're almost trying to balance out the production on both wheels at the same time so that you can optimize uh, what you're getting to build those buildings that you want. The building market forms the crux of a lot of your weighted decisions that you encounter in the game. What I like to do at the beginning of a solo game is to peruse that market board and try and find different building tiles that synergize and combo well together. For example, there's a tile there that allows you to convert three sand uh, resources into one brick resource. And there's also a building upgrade that allows you to upgrade your mason so that each brick at the end of the game is worth three victory points. Seeing those combos early on and trying to work your way towards getting those combos out earlier and ensuring that you have a really good engine going means that you'll be able to reach that 30 victory point mark, which it almost seems impossible to reach in the solo mode. Sometimes it's more beneficial to build buildings that are worth two or three or one and try and build a building a turn rather than just trying to build one big powerful building every like two turns. In that way, you're kind of accruing victory points more and more as you go, but also gaining the benefit of the bonuses and the conversion rates of those buildings as well. So the resource planning in this game requires a lot of strategic thinking, forward planning and work. There is a little bit of a randomness to the way that the buildings are revealed. So even though you're given four choices in the solo mode, you never really know what is going to come next and what will actually work with what you've already established. Yes, I know you can use the Feudal Lord uh, specialist card to kind of reserve one of each of the three different types. And if you use that card several times, your choices do uh, become a lot more plentiful and you do churn through the building tile decks a lot more to try and find that building that works best with your strategy. Do you know those really popular games that people play while they're waiting for a bus like Temple Run or Python? This game has that feeling. I always look for a solo mode that gives you a really positive feeling, but also provides you with enough challenge that you really want to come back to again. The multitude of different combination of building tiles and spatial positions that this game offers to you is mind blowing. The idea that, you know, each time you play this game, the puzzle is gonna be carved out differently. The road is gonna be carved out differently. And that's probably my one gripe about the title of the game is that 
The road feels more metaphoric. The road to producing the best quality glass is more the journey that you take. That journey of trying to attain 30 victory points as outlined in the rule book is incredibly difficult and challenging. And you know what? There is an online solo monthly challenge on the Board Game Geek forums that you can find under the Glass Road page. And each month, uh, there's a little game where you place the tiles in a particular order and then you try and optimize and get the best score and then you post a picture of your result on the forum. The idea that other people are engaging in this solo challenge kind of has this sense of community and I know there's a lot of games that I love playing but I can't always find people to play with them and when a game like Glass Road comes along where I can play it solo, it's so easy to set up, so easy to reset and the puzzle is so invitingly different each time I just can't speak any more highly of it. So in considering my final verdict, Glass Road is probably one of Uwe Rosenberg's best, smoothest and silkiest games. The gameplay is definitely not as transparent as it seems from first glance. In fact, it's an inviting rotational puzzle that keeps you coming back time again. For me, as a gamer who's played quite a lot of Euros, I could definitely consider introducing this to brand new gamers or gamers who kind of want a next level modern board game to get into. Glass Road would definitely be at the top of my list. It ticks all of those boxes of having a unique dial mechanism, the use of resources and comboing tiles and using cards. I think it is a brilliant game to play it solo. For me, Glass Road is definitely a nine out of 10. Thanks once again for joining me for another Board Game Sanctuary video. If you are a patron, thank you for sort of supporting me each and every month and keeping this channel alive. I actually film, produce, script, play, do all the videos myself and any sort of support would definitely be appreciated. And don't forget to look out for your names in the credits at the end of this video. This is Danny signing out. Hope your next game is an enjoyable one. See you later.